Tell us a bit about the history of how the environment uh, came to be a part of the uh, international discourse, uh, a part of the uh, international agenda. And, and first of all, Sam, thank you for taking the time to, to be with us today. Oh, thank you, Jean-Marc. A great pleasure. Well, um, environment has been part of the global discourse and the global agenda for, for many centuries, actually. Um, it's, it originally emerged um, as a sort of natural resource issue. So um, as man began to um, appropriate natural resources outside of national boundaries, it, it, um, like, for instance, the first example of that is fishing, um, this, uh, the regulation of fishing, or the lack of its regulation, um, emerged on the international agenda. So in the 17th century, as maritime law was beginning to be developed, uh, we began to see um, issues about whether fishing should be regulated or not um, emerge on the international agenda. And in fact, the first sort of manifestations of this was this idea of the freedom of the high seas and the, the ability for any state or any f ship to go out and fish um, the, hi the high seas and the international waters uh, without any kind of restrictions on them. So that's, and, and you also, um, uh, similar kind of issues of managing natural resources emerged in Europe, and so there was a number of early bilateral treaties about species which cross boundaries, in particular birds. So it's been on the um, international agenda for quite some time. But I guess modern international environmental law and modern environmental global issues um, began to really emerge in a recognisable form that we see them today, sort of in the early 70s, when the real impacts of, uh, when we're beginning to push these limits that you mentioned in the introduction, when man's uh, activities really began to affect the global environment, uh, in particular, um, you know, like things like at the atmosphere, where it really first began to emerge. So, so the environment is not necessarily a, 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 new, a new issue, it has been on the... Uh, uh, international policy and intellectual table, if you will, for, for, for a number of centuries. And yet, as you just said, I mean, things have uh, somehow uh, uh, intensified, uh, you know, since the early uh, 70s. So, so more specifically, you know, uh, concerning this intensification of concerns vis-à-vis uh, -vis or regarding the environment, I mean, what are the big uh, landmarks in this area and, and, and what have been the key principles at the core of this enterprise, let's say, uh, since the, 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 the early uh, 70s? Well, um, a very important landmark was the 1972 Stockholm Convention, uh, which looked at the human environment and, and uh, development. And really, be, um, that's the beginning of modern um, global environmental issues as, as we see them today. Um, okay. There are also some other... No, Sam, what, it, tri what, what triggered Stockholm? You, you, you mentioned 1972. You know, what triggered Stockholm? Why did we decide that uh, we, we needed this conference in Stockholm? Um, actually, well, I mean, there are many authors of such a successful process, but uh, often um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was uh, as often pointed to as a very important uh, uh, trigger point in the US, which then led to US leadership on this issue and the US calling for such a, 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 um, a conference and, and bringing together this idea about what the global community needed to do to help conserve. There was much more emphasis on conservation in the early 70s than there is nowadays. Um, and so that's what's generally or recognised widely as being the trigger for it. I, I think obviously it varies from country to country, so that kind of perspective is, is, is particularly strong in North America, but I guess if you spoke to the Scandinavians you'd get a different perspective. But I think what triggered it from a sort of universal perspective is that um, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s, we began to see uh, pollution take on an international dimension. So many, uh, and that's what Rachel Carson's book was about, it's about uh, PCPs and mercury poisoning. And we saw similar things in the 50s in Japan and similar things with acid rain in Europe in the late 60s, early 70s. Is that pollution really began to take on this international character, whereas before it had been usually quite a local issue, but in the, with the advent of modern chemicals in the 70s, 60s and 70s, we began to see it taking a transboundary nature. And that's what triggered this kind of um, emergence of, of environment as a much broader based issue, um, a more pollution based issue in the international agenda. So after 72, it just it developed more and more momentum. Um, important kind of 
um, signposts along the, the development of modern international environmental law and policy um, was the 1987 Brundtland Commission, we looked, which coined the phrase sustainable development, which we hear about so much today. Um, and then uh, in the 80s we saw um, the emergence of ozone pollution and, and the world came together to develop a, a treaty to tackle ozone pollution called the 1985 Vienna Convention and it's followed up by the 1987 Montreal Protocol. Um, a significant, and then a very significant milestone in the development of modern international environmental law was the 1992 Rio, Convention, uh, Rio Conference, the Earth Summit. And, and that's when we return to today. The legacy of that um, has been enormous in the development of international environmental law. Out of it came the core set of principles, the Rio, which are embodied in the Rio Declaration, Agenda 21, which was the most comprehensive uh, action plan ever developed for sustainable development, and two very significant environmental treaties, um, the Climate Change Treaty, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, there was also discussion, and later after uh, the momentum was developed at Rio for the Desertification Treaty uh, and the Forestry Principles and a development of fishing regulation under the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. So they are the cornerstones, if you want, of modern international environmental law, all of those documents. And it's within those documents that we find the, the cornerstones of all the principles that have sub subsequently uh, developed and emerged as guiding forces. Um, and so yeah, no, no, Sam. And so, in terms of uh, in terms of landmarks, so you mentioned the the, the conferences, Stockholm, uh, Rio. You 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 mentioned the, the the normative and legal developments having to do with conventions and treaties, and you also mentioned the the, the Brundtland report. And in fact, in, in all the conversations that uh, we are having on, on on environmental issues, I mean, the the the, the Brundtland report comes back again and again. So why is it that this report, which was uh, issued in 1987, why is it that it is so important, in fact, continues to be, to this day, uh, a, a reference? I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it embodies a, a set of universal truths about sustainable development. It articulates them in a very approachable way. And these are enduring ideas. They're not... Um, a, uh, and so it's about uh, how we might develop equitably, how we might develop um, uh, uh, in, a, in an efficient way, how we might develop uh, uh, with good governance at the core of that and rule of the law. And these kind of universal enduring ideas were articulated in a powerful way in, in the report. Uh, we've done that because it was less of a political process and more of a group of very eminent, insightful people coming together to articulate a vision. Um, you, you could say, um, and so it's a powerful document. You can still read it today and see that its message is still very useful, germane, and, and speaks to the problems we face today. Um, Agenda 21, which came out um, of a similar process, but was then ultimately adopted as a political uh, document in, at Rio, um, 1992 Rio conference, uh, uh, is still uh, germane uh, to... Uh, Sam, for the for the for the audience who doesn't know, you know, for the people who don't know much about uh, Agenda 21, Agenda, Agenda 21 stands for for what? Why 21, for instance? It was an agenda for the 21st century, ah, and okay. it was an action plan for the 21st century. Okay. And okay. Um, and it it laid out uh, the kind of uh, steps that governments and civil society and the world community at large had to take in order to try and develop um, sustainably and achieve equity and all, all these other ideas which we've mentioned so far. Um, and it's still just as germane and useful today, but it's written in, in UN political ease and therefore much more uh, uh, turgid and, and, uh, and unapproachable yeah. for for, for everyday use, whereas uh, Agenda 21, um, the Brundtland Commission's report is a very interesting, uh, relatively short political document. So that's why, and, and as I said, it, it, it embodies these enduring truths, which uh, as we come back to again and again and again, and they're, they're, they're in a sense, the, they, they, they indicate that we know what to do in order to develop sustainable. We know how to behave morally and just and equitably, and we, we can see pathways for doing it. Um, 
the, the problem has been not the knowledge or the wisdom about what needs to be done, it's actually the political will to implement those actions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the dilemma which is, or that's the, that's the biggest challenge that the Sustainable Development Agenda and the, the uh, Rio 2012 conference will, will have to face, is how do we mobilise this will, um, generate this momentum at the everyday level, at the coalface, in business, in communities, in governments, to, to take the steps that we know that are needed. And when we, when we have that will, we, we, we can see rapid success, rapid development, and a very good example of the last 20 years where that's been the case was the way the world community came together to, to tackle ozone pollution. And, and there... Uh, sorry, sorry, b before we, we go too far, I just want okay. to, to, right. to, to, to make sure that uh, the audience uh, follows because you know these things uh, very well, but I don't know them, and so I'm just, just you know, step by step. Uh, so there is clearly a link between uh, the, the, the Brundtland Report, uh, the 1992 Rio Declaration, and then the, the various instruments and, and uh, conventions and treaties which were adopted subsequently, right? A very strong link, yes, sir. yes and, at many levels, at many yeah, levels. And, and precisely, you know, I, I guess that one of the links uh, bringing uh, these documents together, or at least uh, uh, displaying a sense of continuity, have to, have to do with the core principles which are at the center of this whole uh, uh, enterprise having to do with the environment. So if you had to, 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 to list the key principles which are at the very center of the environmental agenda, what would be these principles? So that would be my first question. And second question, you, you, you said that, in fact, uh, you know, we, we, we all agree on what, is, what has to be done. The only thing which is missing is uh, somehow uh, political will. And yet, you know, all the debates very often on environmental justice uh, highlight lack of consensus and uh, uh, serious uh, uh, disagreements on, on what would be the, right, the, the, the way to go. So first of all, the core principles. Tell us a bit about these core principles. Okay, well, I, there's a num number of core principles which have merged um, in, in this uh, area, um, and are similar to very other, uh, other areas, um, but I think the first is, is, in, is aptly is legitimacy. Um, there, it is absolutely essential, and it's been demonstrated time and time again, there needs to be a legitimate need for international action, for yeah. there to be... Um, any real positive progress here. And, and, and this is sometimes with a, an area as broad and multidimensional as environmental issues and development, it's, it's a very hard area to define and sometimes the legitimacy in that, ter in that simple way has been um, not really well articulated or understood and, and therefore the development's been much slower. But, but there are some areas where it's very clear there is a legitimate role for the international community uh, the most prominent over the last couple of decades is obviously the atmosphere, because we share the same atmosphere. It circulates very rapidly. So what I put into the atmosphere here in Australia, you will experience the effects of in New York on the other side of the world only within a couple of days. So mm -hmm. that, is an at that is a resource that is a, a part of the environment we share globally. And if we need to manage it with cases of pollution, um, for instance, that needs to happen internationally. Have I... <laughs> Well, so, 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 so the, 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 the legitimacy is more about the, 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 the framework making the case for the need uh, that something has to be done when it comes to, to the environment, so it's the overall framework. But I guess that there are more specific uh, 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 principles. I mean, I know that in a previous conversation yeah. you talked about cooperation, uh, precautionary principle, and so on. So what are the, yeah. the relatively uh, targeted and technical principles beyond or, or within this framework of legitimacy, which I think are the very center of this whole process? Sorry, I just you blanked off on the screen on me. So, uh, okay. <laughs> but um, um, yes, yeah, and within that framework, you're right. Um, there is a number of uh, principles which have emerged. Uh, they, they, 
they, they, they, a, a key one is about cooperation. That the yeah. endeavour needs to be a cooperative one. It's about, um, and that at its heart has got. You've, they've got to be some sort of interest for all parties concerned for them to be involved. Uh, it also has some technical understandings about sharing information, about um, participating legitimately, uh, uh, participating honestly in processes. There are other quick core principles like. Um, uh, a, a very key one is, is undertaking assessments, um, in, environmental impact assessments. It's quite a widespread norm nowadays within this idea. The precautionary principle is, is, a, is, is an idea which has um, a lot of lip service, but in terms of normative content is still very, very weak. Um, well, 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 but it's a popular mean, one. Uh, what do we mean exactly by precautionary principle? What does it mean? It means uh, being able to take action without uh, understanding the full scientific uh, certainty mm -hmm. or, or consequences of something. So we don't need to determine the exact nature of the threat before we take some cautionary measures to perhaps limit that threat. Because, so the, the, um, the, mere, the, the mere thought that there is, that there could be a threat is enough for us to take action? It needs to be a little bit more than the mere thought, but yeah, yeah. yes, we don't need full scientific certainty about the threat before we take action. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a critical cornerstone um, of the way we approach the environment so we don't understand the full impacts of climate change, we didn't understand the full impacts of ozone depletion before we've taken action. But, we, mm -hmm. but there's enough evidence. Uh, you need a body of evidence to support the idea that there is a threat and that there is consequences if we don't take action. But you don't need full scientific certainty. Okay. So that's the idea of the precautionary principle. Um, a very important one um, is about equity um, and fairness, and, and that has a number of different manifestations. But the most prominent one in, the, in, in recent discussions is this idea of, of common differentiated responsibility or leadership, if you will, um, mm -hmm. that, that, that we have e that everybody and countries have different capacities and different responsibilities uh, for these issues. So in particular, in, say, for instance, with ozone depletion or climate change, is that the problem has been largely created by developed world, and the developed world has most of the capacity to respond and tackle the issue. So the developed world should take the leadership and, and make the first steps before the developing world. So that's at its simplest, this idea of common but differentiated responsibility. Um, another very important one which underpins the sort of inf is this idea of access to justice, access to information. Mm -hmm. And, and that is, goes to the enforcement of, of the norms in this area. So um, uh, it, uh, a lot of the compliance mechanisms and the enforcement mechanism in this area, because cooperation is the cornerstone of this area of international law, they, they talk about trying to find cooperative ways to help people out. And, and one of the and the strongest that the enforcement mechanisms get, rather than having some sort of uh, ability or to bring any real cases before the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, it's more about trying to influence uh, action, promote action through transparency and through uh, making information available and so that people can have a look at uh, and examine it from different perspectives and, and people will be, in a sense, uh, held accountable to the public as opposed to legally accountable to any particular norm. So that's another very important key responsibility. Um, there are some more technical ones like um, and, uh, sub subsidiarity, for instance, yeah. is another key responsibility um, and principle. Good governance, respect for the rule S of law and property rights. What, uh, subsidiarity, what does it mean? It's another side of this idea of legitimacy that I mentioned, or the framework, that, that, the, the, that you try and take action at the, at the, if you want, at the lowest level, at the level at the most meaningful, at the closest to the individual. So, mm -hmm. so you, you take an individual action first, community action next, s s national action after that, and international action after that. So you try and generate change and try and generate um, uh, uh, policies and, and measures at the local level first, and then you move up the scale as okay, yeah. the issue. Uh, what about um, and then
What about the principle of the the, pollut the polluter pays? And 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 once again, in our previous conversation, you mentioned the importance of prior notice and and consultation and prior and informed consent. So first of all, the polluter pays. What does it mean? Yes, the polluter pays is a is a principle which refers is based on an economic idea that uh, part of the reason or a major cause of um, pollution is that the polluter doesn't pay in that the polluter can just throw their trash or their garbage out the window and, and not have to worry about the costs of cleaning it up. And mm -hmm. so economically, uh, they, if, if that's the case, economically they'll over-pollute because it's, they don't actually suffer the consequences of, of their actions. So the idea in, in modern uh, international and modern environmental issues is to try and make people pay for their pollution and mm. pay for the social and environmental and economic costs of that pollution and thereby incorporate those costs into the product itself and the product in a sense then will become uh, more self-regulating or more sustainable because it will have incorporated the, the full extent of its costs and its impacts from its use, and whereas at the moment that is often not the case. Yeah. And so this is an idea which has emerged as a basic principle that um, underpins a lot of the pollution control regimes um, in, at the international level, but also um, at regional and national levels as well. And, and then you have prior, non, uh, prior notice and consultation, and then prior informed consent. So these are two of the remaining principles which are the core of these debates. I mean, tell us a bit about these two principles. Yeah, it's a, I guess it's a it's a it's a manifestation of that basic idea of cooperation. Is that you should um, you should inform your neighbours and and your community about what you plan to do, so that they have a chance to respond and and sit, and participate in its development and its decision making. It's just a manifestation of that. Um, it's. Uh, it's a basic idea which has existed in international law and, and in international environmental law since uh, the turn of the last century. So, um, yeah. but it's, it's just essentially a note of it's it's good manners, it's good neighbourly manners to actually <laughs> communicate with your your um, neighbours if you're going to do something which will impact on that. And that that enjoys a, a fundamental customary right at international law as it does in in most communities yeah. as well. Uh, and so these principles at the core of what have been the debates uh, on environmental issues since the, 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 the early 70s, they also have served as guidelines. Uh, but uh, are, are they also objects of debate? I mean, is there a total consensus on them or uh, are, uh, are, are they principles which are uh, at the center of uh, heated debates? I mean, do we all agree on, on, uh, on, on these principles? I mean, for instance, developed I, countries and developing yep. countries, do they, uh, are they all uh, on the same page on these principles? No, uh, I think that as headlines, uh, they enjoy widespread support and there'd be little comment about them as a headline, although that's not true for all of them. So, for instance, this idea of precautionary approach or principle it's an issue which is discussed, but, but what happens is, and where um, there is a lot of division and difference of view, is when you get into the detail of what they actually mean and how yeah. you implement them in a, in a specific context. And there, there is a wide variety of views, and, and so <clears throat> what you find is that um, if you look at the commentary on international law, you'll find that these are, there's a, a, I think, as a basket of ideas, there's general agreement that they exist as customary principles of international law, but um, they're, they're in a sense in terms of whether that you can use them to hold people to account or guide specific actions, they, they don't have that normative clarity, that detail. And that's why we've seen over the last uh, 40 years of this area, the, the, these principles be elaborated in any meaningful way through treaties, where the specific content of these basic principles is discussed and agreed upon amongst the, the member states of the United Nations. So that's uh, oh, the... Yeah, yeah. So, so in fact, these principles are, are more like, uh, you know, uh, 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 a framework, I mean, uh, 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 an impressionistic uh, 
uh, outline of, of where we want to go and how we go uh, how, and how we want to go about this. But then all, all, all these things have to be specified and debated. So, so on this issue, I mean, two questions. First of all, uh, of course, all these debates on the environment are, are, are also of value in connection with development issues. So. You know, we have been talking about MDGs for now um, 10 years or so. So what, what is the connection uh, existing between, you know, uh, the environmental discourse, environmental debates, and uh, the discourse on development on the, on the, on the MDGs? And then, second, second of all, I mean, since you mentioned that o over, the, over, over the course of the years, these principles are evolving, tell us a bit about this evolution. So first of all, connection between uh, environmental issues and, and development and MDGs? It's also been an issue for as long as we've been talking about environmental issues on the international agenda and at the national level, is that it's the, the biggest environmental um, degrader is poverty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore, um, from that idea has emerged this concept that you can't divide development and environment uh, two sides of the same coin. And you can't have one without the other. If you, if you wish to develop, you need to pay attention to the environmental limits of, of, of your activity. But um, and if you wish to really maintain the environment and conserve the environment, you can't do that without tackling poverty. And that has its manifestation in this idea um, that poverty and development and environment are all intertwined, interlinked, and um, are really uh, uh, manifestations of, a, of the same problem, and this is mm -hmm. where you get this idea that, you, that, that um, this idea that sustainable development has these three pillars: economic, social, and environment. Meaning that you can't move ahead on any one of these issues uh, without paying attention to the other. Mm -hmm. I guess um, so. That's how they're linked, and, and more in a general way, in a, most, in a more philosophical way. I mean, they they do have more uh, concrete impacts. So, for instance. Um, the reason why environmental, another reason why environmental problems have emerged so prominently over the last 30 years is the rapid, is the huge economic expansion that we've experienced over the last 30 years, yeah. which has made a big inroad into poverty as well. Mm. So, so, so we've seen... So, so isn't it paradoxical, Sam, because on the one hand you just said that uh, one of the uh, biggest environmental degraders is poverty, and I would want you to tell us why it is the case. And, and on the other hand, you're also telling us that I mean, economic growth is, generate, is generating a lot of uh, environmental degradation, uh, and yet uh, economic growth is seen as a, as, a, as a way through which you tackle and somehow overcome poverty. So first uh, element of your proposition, poverty is one of the biggest uh, of the uh, environmental degraders. That's what you said a little bit earlier. So why is it the case? Because if you're a poor, you, 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 you're taking very short-term decisions just to survive, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're very, very poor, then um, where you get your next bowl of rice from or the next pile of firewood from is, uh, is, is determined by the absolute hunger in your belly or the freezing cold nature of the winter. And it's not determined by any long-term planning. So, mm -hmm. it's if you, so it's, that's at its simplest. So, whereas if you are, are, are relatively well off, well, then you can begin to plan and, and, and make long-term plans. And, and you then also have the resources to implement those plans. So at its simplest, that's um, where, where we find uh, the, the, this link. Um, mm -hmm. And globally, um, it has manifestations at the national level as well. So you can see that countries which are the poorest in the world have no ability whatsoever to manage or plan long term for all of their sectors, and, and their mean, natural resource use depend, is, is, tends to be much more um, um, uh, wasteful. And you know, would, has, uh, would, would you say, for instance, that the, 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 the situation of deforestation existing in Haiti is an example of how poverty can uh, lead to? Uh, uh, you know uh, the destruction of the, of the environment because I mean you know people uh, in order to cook have to uh, have access to wood and then leads to uh, deforestation and so would you say that it is an example? A very good example and it's a shame we don't have um, PowerPoint or imagery here because it's there's a wonderful uh, satellite imagery of of Haiti and the Dominican Republic side by side and, and on the same island and Haiti is completely deforested and the Dominican Republic is a green luscious uh, 
half mm-hmm. of the island. So that's a good, mm-hmm. very good example. And so, so, and that's yeah, no, so, 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 Sam, poverty uh, contributes to, to really uh, the degradation of, env- of the environment, but at the same time, development and economic growth is also uh, uh, contributed to, uh, to pollution and uh, grad- degradation of, inv- of, of the environment, right? I mean, developed countries are, are partly uh, seen as being responsible for, uh, for this. That's true. The development historically has been a big source of pollution and, and impact on the environment. Um, but through, the, and there is a, a, a development process, a model which we've experienced over the last 100 years, which also has a, an upside at the other end, which is once you reach a, a basic level of development where you can provide a basic level of, of, of economic stability and well-being for your population, you then begin to turn the, the, the country, the community, turns its mind to managing its environment with more aesthetic values and more moral values and more environmental values. And, and you see that, say, for instance, very clearly in Europe where you know, the, the environment's managed very differently nowadays than it was 200 years ago when it was being managed for famine and things like war and stuff but, like but, that. So, but what, what about in the US context? Well, I think a similar ex- process has happened in Europe, in, in the US context. Uh, uh, initially, the development um, in, the ni- in the 18th and 19th century in the US was very harmful to its environment um, and had a big impact on its environment uh, in many ways, through pollution, through chemical pollution, but also through deforestation, through the dust bowls in, in the Midwest and stuff like that. And nowadays, um, where it's a much more, it's a totally different economy and there's a lot more capacity in the economy to manage things um, for multiple purposes. Um, you can see that the environment in America has uh, improved over the last couple of generations quite dramatically. So, for instance, in, you, in your part of the world, in New England, it used to be totally deforested and now yeah. all of New England is, is one huge forest, so that, as but an example well, of yeah, it. Yeah. Like what, what about all these debates about uh, reduction of gas emissions and the fact that, for instance, the, the Europeans and the Americans don't see eye to eye on, on this matter? I mean, you know, there is an unwillingness or reluctance in the US to change <coughs> Lifestyle, for instance. That's a. I don't think that's really a problem peculiar to the U.S. Yeah. People yeah. are reluctant to change their lifestyles. It just so happens that in the U.S., their lifestyle is more um, materialistic and yeah. consumptive than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And I think that in in the big historical arc um, and the big picture of this issue, like with climate change, it's not. We're, we're, in, we're, in, we're in there sort of the bottom of the curve, if you want, at the moment. Mm-hmm. We're at the moment of development where we are emitting more we're, uh, car, greenhouse gases um, than we'll ever do in the, in the course of human history. And that the development of the future will be much more um, uh, carbon in, uh, neutral and production of energy will be much less carbon intensive and, and so I think you know in a couple of generations time is that actually this will be seen as the bottom of that development curve for energy production and that, mm-hmm. and that if in the bigger picture is I think it's, it's very important to remember in the climate change discussions especially is that we're faced with a crisis that's for sure And we have to change, that's for sure, and that will be very difficult. We have to change our personal lifestyles, which are going to be even harder. But out of that crisis and out of that challenge, enormous opportunities exist. And Mm -hmm. so there will be winners and losers. Um, You know, the energy, the production of energy is a global business. It's predicted to be worth $22 trillion by 2030. And that's uh, most of that, and it's most of that... um, investment in energy infrastructure and energy production, $22 trillion is going to happen in the developing world over the next generation. And so countries which are well positioned and can take advantage of that opportunity will do very well and countries which don't will miss out and, and be left behind. So it's, but I think overall you'll see uh, that um, this, this, this problem, this pollution problem if you want, um, will be different and emerge as just a transition and a kind of an, a type of revolution that we've experienced many of before, like the Industrial Revolution, the Bronze Age, Iron Age, etc. It'll be just another transition in human development.
It will have huge problems and consequences and challenges. I don't want to underestimate that. But just in the over human arc of development over centuries, this is where it, I think at the bottom of, 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 mm -hmm. of the problem, where it's it, at its most dire, at its most threatening, and the challenge seems at its greatest. And, and so the, you, you mentioned earlier that the, 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 the principles uh, which you listed uh, earlier in the conversation uh, have evolved in the past uh, uh, 40 years, and, and I guess you would say that they have evolved, evolved partly under the pressure of economic life and, and the, the, the need for economic growth and so on and so on. So, you know, what have been uh, the, the, the key issues at the center of, uh, of this evolution, and, and how does uh, uh, how economic life has unfolding has unfolding the past 40 years, both for developing countries and including, you know, emerging countries and developed countries. How does it? How did it impact uh, the evolution of the debates and the specification uh, of of these core principles and so on? Well, I think um, in terms of development, the econ you're right. The economic development is. Um, the dominant feature of the last 40 years and will be the dominant feature of the next 40 years. So the world is, has, has tripled its GDP over the last 40 years and it's predicted to triple tripled, tripled. again. Tripled, yes. Wow. So it's, and it's predicted to triple again over the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. So our impact on the environment as a result is going to increase significantly. And, mm -hmm. and I think that economic development um, is, is, is is an essential and a good thing to happen. But, but what has not happened to date, and what needs to happen over the next 40 years, is that economic development be equitable and mm -hmm. be fair and be more efficient. So <clears throat> although it, it has brought great benefit to many, many people, and, and many countries have benefited enormously from that huge economic development, many have been left behind. Mm -hmm. So the UN still estimate that 1.2 billion people are poor and live under $2 a day. And that's a very, very, you know, that's the starkest indictment of how this development hasn't been spread out effectively or equitably. Mm -hmm. So I think that needs to change. So the social dimensions of development and the environmental dimensions of development similarly have not um, benefited as much from this economic development as they all need to. If you want to think about it in terms of concrete ideas and, and meaningful ideas about, as opposed to these basic broad principles that we're talking about. This is where I think uh, the MDGs is a very valuable uh, part of the sustainable development jigsaw, if you want. And, mm -hmm. and for me, the MDGs represent the culmination of 20 or 30 years of various UN conferences and international work to come up with a set of targets, indicators and goals, which, um, we'll, which we, we've set ourselves at the international level uh, to try and balance um, the and, and make uh, the balanced development and ec economic development in particular make it more equitable and make it more sustainable. And, and there you look into those goals and those indicators and those targets and you can see meaningful things like you know, reduce child mortality, reduce poverty by half, um, increase forest, uh, tackle forest degradation, increase the number of national parks, etc., etc. But I, I, and you see, so for, for, for the way I, I see the big picture being put together in, in the international is we have these norms that we've been talking about, all these principles, these core ideas that we've been talking about, like legitimacy, cooperation, prior informed consent, etc. And we have a basket of goals, if you want, targets, which have sort of meaningful, concrete content for people and, 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 and ideas. And, and, and they go together in that sort of way. One's a basket of principles and tools or a map or a, a road, and the other one's a sort of signpost along the road where we're trying to get to. And, um, and both for the environment and for development, right? Indeed. Yeah. And, and you, As you I said, they're both seen interlinked. And so yes. this idea... An important milestone which we didn't mention was which really brought this idea together in a concrete way was the Millennium Development Goals, but it was subsequently followed by another UN conference, which was the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002 in Johannesburg. And it really brought together this idea that these three elements are really integral parts, a, a helix a, 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 a of of the, the path on the tools for development, and, and you, you can't have one without the other. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned the, the, the Millennium Development Goals, the, the MDGs. I mean, and, and you know, 
I understand that it's about goals, but there is something that I don't understand about this, and I'm not a, a development economy, so it's not surprising that I don't understand it. But, uh, you know, okay, so we have this goal. So first question, are we uh, achieving these goals? And second of all, what are the tools that we are giving ourselves to achieve these goals? Because, I mean, have we allocated financial resources to really uh, uh, enhance uh, the level of development in these uh, various areas to achieve these goals? And, and for me, what is a bit amazing, a bit surprising, is that somehow, you know, uh, in the ability of countries to achieve this goal is partly based on a uh, happy relationship between the private sector and the public sector. It is partly based on, on, on a more effective uh, system of governance at the national level and at the international level. And I don't, see the, I don't really see uh, these issues as being part of the MDG's discourse. Well, um, there was a high-level uh, meeting uh, associated with uh, the General Assembly last year, um, which reviewed progress towards the goals and concluded that uh, basically many of the goals were being met. And the most important one I've already mentioned is that poverty, that the, the goal to reduce poverty by half by 2015 had been met or was going to be met. So, so Sam, are... S S Sam, second question. So how are we achieving these goals? I mean, you know, we always talk, we always talk about the achievement of these goals, but, I mean, what is the methodology for these goals to be achieved? Um, but before I answer that, a lot of the goals haven't been met. So yeah, the, yeah. Um, in particular, um, very important goals dealing with female access to justice, education, health services, etc., hasn't been met. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a mixed, it's a mixed picture. Um, how are they being met? Well, less and less, as you've alluded to in the third question you asked, less and less by governments and more and more by private sector, and less and less by... So there is a... a we see a global attraction of public governance here and mm. in all areas of life and a growing expansion of private activity. And so we see private sector taking on board ideas and activities which a couple of generations ago we would have thought as purely as, as sort of government public sector activities. And that's happening in development as much as it's happening in other areas of life. So, so you're right. Um, the, and we can see that a manifestation of that is this idea that, um, that the governments are turning to now to try the main tool or that's being promoted as one of the main tools for achieving um, the, the last part, the, the development goals, the Millennium Development Goals over the next 10 years or 15 years is looking to the private sector and this idea of developing the green economy. Um, so governments are promoting this idea in a sense because um, they see it as being the driving engine of development and economic, economic development, social development, but they also sense their growing impotence in, in mm -hmm. addressing these issues and their retraction and their unwillingness to, of the the, 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 the constituencies they represent to really s s take on board these kind of activities. So, so that's very, very right. Um, the Millennium Development Goals, as a group of goals and a basket of activities and everything, doesn't have any one mechanism to development, uh, to develop them or implement them or even, in fact, monitor them. What they were was a collection of, of indicators and goals which had merged in a whole series of different processes and discussions and conferences which were uh, kind of brought together with it by the General Assembly um, as a sort of basket of headline uh, goals to try and reach by essentially by 2015. Most of them talk about 2015. But all of the goals are enduring. All of the goals will... And, and, and when we get to 2015, you could easily... Uh, uh, the goals could be reasonably re and probably will be re-established for some future date, like 2050 or something like that. So mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing... Like, we won't... They won't become useless in 2015. So you'll always want to reduce poverty, for instance. And you'll always want... Um, adequate access for children to health and to education, etc. They're fundamental and enduring goals of all governments at all stages of development. Um, so, um, and I think in terms of this uh, changing roles of government, it's got many manifestations, and, 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 uh, it, but in terms of development, it's, it, it, it kind of unfolds in different ways, in different areas, and in different countries. And it's, I, it's very, it, for me, it's not easy to come up with some sort of universal ideas about it at the moment, other than to say that the, it's this, this, this growing 
private sector, pri NGO, civil society involvement in international affairs is very, very strong in the development discussions. Um, and there is, uh, for, um, and it's had, I think it's had a very long history. So for instance, mm -hmm. the countries in Southeast Asia, for instance, um, their economic model was based in part mainly on this idea that the private sector was going to provide them the answer. So, so the, the idea um, that, that, and it's an interesting comparison to say Africa. So it, Southeast Asia rejected the Washington Consensus, rejected the World Bank, the IMF measures by and large, and said we want to develop by ourselves, we use our own resources, we'll take our own path and we don't want to follow this advice from uh, the World Bank as much as say what happened in Africa, where it's much more uh, strongly followed the, the, uh, or was influenced by uh, the Washington Consensus. And in Southeast Asia, um, they found their own development path, which was largely revolved around the private sector and a very minimal kind of con um, uh, uh, and promoting uh, education and R&D and niche developments. And although it had a strong public flavour to it and there was a lot of public planning in it, it was driven by this kind of uh, private sector ideas and motivation and incentives. And, and you can see the result, of, which um, is that nowadays Southeast Asia is, 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 a, is looked at to a great success. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we need to incorporate these kind of ideas more effectively in the international discourse, especially in the development discourse. And peop that's what people are looking for. And I guess that's one of the main hopes for um, the Rio 2012 conference is that is that by identifying these bright ideas which have worked around the world and bringing them together, we might, um, we first of all, we promote the idea and so we bring um, the experience and the lesson to the world. And second of all, by promoting that and sharing uh, what's, what's worked and what hasn't in concrete ways in different environments, uh, we may really learn and energise uh, the kind of changes that you were talking about at the beginning that we need to make in terms of lifestyle yeah. and government. So, so uh, we're one year away from uh, the uh, Rio uh, 2012 conference, which is going to be dealing uh, with environmental issues and celebrating the 20th, 20th anniversary of, uh, of Rio 1992, and I guess uh, outlining roadmap for the future. Uh, are we going to be witnessing in the context of this, uh, you know, high-level conference, the kind of disagreements which has existed, which have existed between developed countries and developing countries in the context of uh, um, the Copenhagen conference, which took place in uh, 2009, and Cancun uh, uh, last year, and so on. So I mean, you know. Uh, what is going to be at the centre of the debates uh, in the context of this uh, Rio Plus 20 conference? Uh, well, the Rio 2012 conference has an enormous legacy in that one of the most important milestones that we mentioned earlier on was the 1992 Rio conference. And mm -hmm. so there's a great, great expectations for uh, the conference and there's great hopes for what it will achieve. But in terms of um, uh, in terms of output, in terms of concrete output, in terms of law and norms and development of the principles that we've talked about, um, that's not on the agenda. So we're not looking at developing new legal instruments, framework conventions, principles, or whatever. Um, the focus on there uh, of the preparations for the Rio 2012 conference have have been on. Um, uh, much more along the lines that we were just discussing about what role can the green economy play in in, in addressing development issues. Um, there is also a, a fair amount of attention being played to something called the institutional architecture about whether the, um, what, what kind of changes need to be made within the UN and outside of the UN at the international level in terms of organisations to help promote this type of development. But, um, so within that context, it's hard to see the kind of drama uh, and the disagreement that we witnessed in Copenhagen, because um, the issue will be more about promoting success stories, identifying success stories and promoting them and seeing what really works at the ground level, um, and then about trying to come together as a global community and commit to a new target of one sort or another. And that, um, and what role should a country play in, in reaching that target? And that, that's at its essence why Copenhagen was such a dramatic event and why we, we um, 
intellectually anyway, there was such a disagreement over it because it was the transition in that regime from being um, a globally driven process with a global target which was apportioned responsibility for apportioned to countries to being a much more diffuse, bottom-up, uh, uh, kaleidoscope type process whereby countries would voluntarily commit to doing things based on their own national assessment and own national capabilities and own national needs. And, and with, so, so that's um, um, what we're going to... And, and we'll see, so for instance, at the next meeting in the climate change process in Durban, it'll be less dramatic uh, than Copenhagen or Cancun because we won't have this kind of headline discussion about whether we should be globally driven or trying to get to a, a global commitment. or It will be much more about well, what do we do as individuals, as communities, as nations, and how do we share that experience collectively and make the most out of it. So we go from a top-down to a bottom-up approach, yeah. which why will be so less divisive, basically. Yeah, well, why is it so difficult for developed countries and for developing countries, and even you know, for developed countries, for instance, between the US and the Europeans, why is it so difficult to somehow find a, uh, common ground on, on uh, issues of, uh, uh, of uh, sustainable development and of uh, issues having to do with the environment. Why, why is it so, uh, you know, uh, divisive? I think that uh, the issue has been uh, divisive at a number of levels uh, for different reasons. So a lot of the uh, division is actually just a, um, a but the politics of the issue. So, um, you know, the previous administrations and the feeling within Congress, for instance, has been very anti-multilateralism. And uh, one, of the, one of the costs of that um, opposition to multilateralism has been the environment. And so the US previously, as I mentioned, was the, one of the principal uh, supporters of the, of the Stockholm, the 1972 Stockholm Convention, and many of the early instruments, it promoted them and, and provided the momentum for their development, um, now is playing an opposite role simply because of politics. It doesn't see, uh, it feels uh, um, that multilateralism is, a, is it constrains its, its power and its, uh, its development. So it hasn't seen the political circles in Washington haven't seen it as being useful. And the neocons in particular were famous for, for, for seeing it as a, a block, uh, a barrier to their, their goals. Um, that's, that, that's beginning to change and you can see a different level of engagement with the US on these issues now. Um, but and and, um, and similar, that's happened in other countries where the political forces have swung back and forth about the, the, the need for this kind of action. I think, though, over the long term, I don't think um, the uh, differences are really that that great. I think that mm -hmm. ultimately, and and there isn't this monolithic view. And say, for instance, in the, in any of these countries. So, for instance, in the U.S., um, many of the states see the need for greenhouse gas reductions and are developing schemes at a state level and um, California most recently has developed a very proactive scheme which will um, which is is open to international carbon credits and is really pushing forward the agenda the same in New England and there's lots of other examples at, at, at local level too. So, so, and you could see how, for instance, the Clean Air Act in the States was emerged from California's leadership on, on, on car emissions. Maybe the same will happen and a radical transformation will happen um, driven by the states on climate change. So, but I think the important thing to, to note about this is perhaps the, di the, the divergence on, on these issues is is about detail and not so much about the overall long-term impact. And that, and that really people, as I said at the beginning, I guess the, a lot of the, the, the tools are known, uh, but the will to implement them requires overcoming short-term invested interests, so got something to lose. And, and, and that's where we see the resistance. A lot of the, the origin of the resistance comes out of those vested short-term interests. And the countries, and what's happening as the world becomes much more multi, um, multipolar and more complex, and you see it in any one of the environmental issues that we've talked about, but in particular in climate change, is that many countries, like in China, is developing le world leadership in solar technology, and that's going to. That's already a multi-billion-dollar industry in China. They're going to make 
their leadership, they're going to turn their leadership into a, a huge export commodity for them and they'll become, in a sense, an energy producer, a global energy producer, because they've got the cheap, clean, easy technologies for solar which they can roll out. And, you know, they plan to be the world's civil engineers and they'll roll this technology out and make lots and lots of money and develop lots and lots of uh, uh, alternative energy systems based on that idea. So, and, and that will happen... Um, even as China moves from a, a much more uh, into a much more diverse society, which you can see happening now, and so, and so, I, I don't. I think these um, these these points of difference um, are not kind of universal and profound. They just kind of they they're where these complex issues have always had points of friction due to different interests, different personalities, different politics, and different and short-term goals. But I think the long-term goal. Is, is relatively un, uh, clear and understood, and it's, what will happen is that the countries that make the most of the opportunities invest, lead their way into the new technology, new energy productions, into these new opportunities about development on education, for instance, uh, will be the ones that gain, and, and the ones that don't will be the ones that are left behind, and they'll be the, the ones that we'll be talking about in a generation's time. Yeah. When we think about the relationship between the environment and, uh, and environmental debates and uh, sustainable development, uh, which, which one of these two notions is the most important? Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I would assume, once again, I'm not a specialist, that sustainable development is, is the goal, and then somehow uh, looking after the environment is the tool to really make development sustainable. Am I right or am I wrong? It's one way of looking at it, yes. I think um, uh, it's just it's a point of emphasis uh, and uh, whether it, people you talk know, about I, sustainable... I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to, 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 to share with the audience, you know, how do we go about uh, uh, setting up priorities? I mean, you know, I, I, would, I would think that the goal is sustainable development, right? Because we, we, we want to survive, we want it to be effective, efficient, we want it to be equitable and so on and so on. Uh, and and uh, looking after the environment would be a way to achieve uh, sustainable development or, or is looking after the environment uh, uh, an, a goal uh, in itself? I, I, again, it's a, there's no easy answer to that uh, idea. It's a point of view. The, the main goal for developing countries for the vast majority of the world, and the main, therefore, should be the main goal of the international community, is eradicating poverty. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the overriding priority, and it's recognised as an overriding priority in the, in, in the multilateral environmental agreements. And, 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 and it's and, a reality and, about... And, Sam, you, you, you feel that there is a, 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 a potential conflict between eradication of poverty and sustainable development, or...? Or should we think that uh, the best way to eradicate the poverty in the long run is to go for a model of development which is one of sustainable development? Very much the latter. The mm -hmm. development isn't sustainable if it disregards the environmental limits that we operate mm -hmm. within. And mm -hmm. there are many civilizations which have collapsed, which have shut up a testimony to that. The story of the Eastern Islanders is a perhaps one of the best known, where you know, the most isolated island in the world um, developed uh, incredibly um, in 2,000 years ago, but it was unsustainable and it was based on basically chopping down the forest cover of the island. And, mm -hmm. and so when it was rediscovered by Europeans in the, seventh, in the 15th, 16th century, the, the community there living on that island was living in hovels and a level of poverty which is a lot akin to the Stone Age. So um, that's the lesson that faces us, the lesson we know from history that if you don't pay, one of the limitations, one of the issues that needs attention in that um, development process is the environment. Um, but what, the, but, but we, what we have to do um, in terms of making sure that we don't end up like Easter Island is make sure that, the, that this pursuit to eradicate poverty is done in a more efficient way than it has happened over the last 200 years. And is, there chance, a more yeah, is there a chance, uh, Sam, that uh, we could end up like uh, Easter Island? There is a chance, yes. Of course, it's more than possible that we could end up like Easter Island. And um, 
And there are many predictions about that. Uh, I think the, they're very hard to um, um, uh, verify and be accurate about because uh, our system as a biological system, the Earth as a biological system, we don't know very much about. And, most, and more importantly, it has things called tipping points. So what happens is that the, the environment can absorb a certain impact and, and, and you see relatively little change, and then something will change and it'll tip over the edge and you'll lose the entire uh, service. So, for instance, a very well-known story in, in your part of the world is the cod banks um, off Halifax. And there um, they were fished heavily um, and the, 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 cod, the cod stocks collapsed in 1992. Um, and eventually there was a moratorium putting on the fishing. And they collapsed due to overfishing and a moratorium was put in place. Um, and, but the cod stocks have never returned in the 20 years since and are unlikely ever to return. So that, there's an example of a tipping point. They were fishing, overfishing, but they were still getting quite a high level of catch and then suddenly it vanished, just in the space of a couple of weeks it just vanished like that. And the same could be the case with um, climate change. A lot of, there are a lot of suggested tipping points like the melting of the Greenland um, ice cap or the, the convection currents in the ocean, stuff like that, may suddenly switch and all of a sudden you get a cataclysmic change in the carrying capacity of the environment, which would have a cataclysmic effect on, on world development and world security. And that's, that's the, the scariest thing, is, is that we may unwittingly cross one of those tipping points because we have no idea how close we are to them on most of the key indicators or most of the key uh, services we derive from the environment. So that's the really uh, troubling thing, which, which regardless of the detail and the accuracy of it or whatever, it does exist. That, it, that is a reality. And if we went over those tipping points, we could end up like Easter Island. And so in light of this kind of uh, dramatic uh, landscape, <laughs> I mean, what should be our uh, aspirations for Rio plus 20, for Rio 2012? I mean, you know, what, what should be, uh, you know, reasonable and workable goals on which we should focus between now and uh, a year from now. I mean, you know, what should we uh, hope for? The opportunity that Rio 20, 2012 provides us, um, in all of us, is to, I guess, uh, reflect on uh, the context of where we work in. I don't think, as I said, that there's any real, there's not going to be specific legal issues that come out of uh, Rio 20. 12. There's no framework convention or instrument or anything which is being discussed as being or negotiated. But what it does um, and, and is it allows us in thinking and preparing and making the most of this important opportunity which has this huge legacy is I guess to reflect on where we fit in the bigger picture and, and what are the real global challenges that we face. As I said, often when we're just talking about climate change, we're focused on the little part of the climate change issue that interests us or that we're negotiating, and the bigger picture is harder to, to, to reflect upon and find the opportunity to discuss. So that's one of the issues. I think in all of us who are thinking about Rio 2012, it provides a great opportunity to connect all the dots, see the big picture and understand where our, our efforts fit and how important each of our individual efforts fit. I think another opportunity which we, um, Rio 2012, is, may provide is indeed a reflection, a, a very a more accurate reflection of this increasing multipolarity of the world. And so we'll see not so much attention on the summit and the heads of state and what they come to do, but we'll see much, as much energy and as much important stuff happening in the business sector parallel events and the civil society parallel events. And so um, that, that, that will reflect that increasing polarity of the world and that increasing complexity of the issue. But I think, and the third thing I think which we can expect out of uh, Rio 2012 is a highlight, a showcase of wonderful successful examples of sustainable development, not so much at the international level but much more at the local level and this we'll see. So it'll be a great opportunity for um, promoting concrete success stories at the village, at the community, at the local, national, municipal level. And so that would be a very interesting, rich um, set of 
experiences and knowledge that we've got to learn about and something which the UN system as a whole is, is increasingly taking on board. But this would be a great opportunity to really open that up and, and incorporate those, that experience and, and map, incorporate that ideas, those goals into things like the MDGs a lot more effectively.